All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to see so many people already here and ready to go. We're going to wait a couple minutes before we get started because people are still filing in. Um, but I just want to introduce myself first. My name is Sam Hillestad. I am a senior product marketing manager here at Set Sail, and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, first things first, just a couple logistics. I want to let you all know that this is being recorded today. So we'll send out the recording to everyone along with a copy of the slides. So no need to take copious notes and screenshots unless you really want to. This is also completely live. So I'd love to take advantage of that. Uh, we have a couple instances in our presentation today where we'll have some polls and questions for the audience. Uh, and you should feel free to ask questions throughout. There's a box on the right hand side of your screen where you can put in your questions and comments. And just to get used to it, let's start off with an easy one. A lot of you are already doing this, but uh, if folks want to drop in where they're calling in from, that'd be great. I know we'll, we'll probably have people from all over the world. Uh, I myself am calling in from Providence, Rhode Island right now, where we're actually getting some pretty heavy snow randomly. Um, and we also have two guest speakers with us today. Let's uh, meet them really quick. Uh, we have Peter Ostro on the line, the VP and Research Director of Sales Enablement at Forrester. Peter, where are you calling in from? Hey, Sam, uh, outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And we had some sprinkly snow earlier today, and now it's just like 33 degrees and awful rainy icky. I think that's what it's going to get to here in a bit. Yeah. Uh, and we're also joined by Sri Vatsamarthi, our head of product at Set Sail. Sri, where are you calling in from? So I'm calling in from San Francisco, but uh, interestingly, I'm from uh, Ottawa, Ontario, and I saw somebody uh, that's from there, which is uh, it's not often that I see somebody from my hometown. So. Hey, Matthew. Cool. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. And yeah, we, we do have people from all over Illinois, UK, uh, some other people in Boston, a lot of San Francisco, Utah, Ukraine. Very cool. Um, all right. So uh, we people are still filing in. Uh, we're just going to give folks a couple more minutes before we go ahead and get started with our presentation. Um, everyone, make sure you have your coffee or your lunch, depending on your time zone. Um, I just finished my coffee, so if I seem at all jittery, that's probably why. Um, so let's see. Uh, we're, we're a couple minutes in. We have a lot of people on the line. Uh, I actually think we should be good to go. So hello, everyone, and welcome to this joint set sail and pavilion webinar. Again, my name is Sam, and I am thrilled to be joining you all today live to talk about a sort of New Year's resolution I think a lot of people in sales have, particularly if you're a manager. And that's, how do I become a better sales coach? How do I become a better mentor? How do I help my team grow and learn and thrive? And once again, I'm very lucky to be joined today by two experts in this field who think about this question a lot. Uh, we have our guest speaker from Forrester today, Peter Ostro. Thanks for coming on, Peter. And do you want to give the audience a quick intro of yourself? Sure, Sam. Hey, everybody. Uh, so I'm Peter, and I lead the sales enablement research team for B2B companies here at Forrester. I've uh, been an analyst for 14 years. So that was at uh, three different companies now. And prior to that, a whole career of being a B2B salesperson, sales manager, ops enablement. So hopefully having walked in your shoes lends a little bit of credibility to what we have to share today. Great. And again, thank you for, for coming on and lending us your expertise. We are also joined by Sri Vatsamarthi, our head of product at Set Sail. Uh, thanks for joining us, Sri. Yeah, no problem. And do you want to let the audience know a little bit more about yourself as well? Yeah, sounds good. So uh, as Sam mentioned, I lead product management at Set Sail. Um, just a little background. I joined Set Sail about four years ago, shortly after the company was founded. And I've been part of the team for almost the entire journey. Um, prior to set sail, I spent four years at Google in sales operations, where my job was essentially to use data science to help our organization manage reps based on leading indicators of revenue. So very related to what set sail does today. Yep. Uh, all right, great. So with that, I'll go over a brief agenda. We have a full hour today because we have a ton of content for you. And like I said, we want to make this as interactive as possible. So we're going to start off with a poll and a question for the audience. Uh, and then we'll dive into um, Peter's presentation, which is all about the Forrester approach to sales coaching, um, which is you know about uh, performance uh, and 
metrics. Uh, and he and Sri will talk about how to put those metrics into powerful, actionable dashboards. Sri is also going to give us an overview of set sales, take on data-driven coaching. And then we really want to have an open-ended discussion on this, uh, which should definitely include the audience. That'll come at the end. But again, feel free to drop in a question or a comment at any time. So with that, here's my first question for the audience. And it's uh, pretty straightforward. And you know, it's about what we're talking about today. And it's what does it mean to be a good sales coach? Right? It sounds simple, but there, there are kind of a lot of layers to this. If you have an answer, drop it in the chat box. I'll be monitoring that. But I also want to hear some first reactions from our speakers. Peter, what's your first reaction to this question? I think being a good sales coach, Sam, is probably not unlike being a good salesperson, which is to remember that the ratio of organs in our body, we've got two ears, two eyes, but only one mouth. So listening and looking and observing and taking in as opposed to just, you know, giving the man a fish per se. <laughs> I like that. Uh, and, and Shri, what about you? What's your first reaction to this question? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with that. And, you know, from our perspective, a good coach is also data driven. Um, you know, we believe that data helps lead coaches to the right things to coach for each rep um, in a very customized, but also uh, efficient way. And, you know, yes, with without data, you can spend a lot of time with each rep and, and get to the right insights. But data helps you get there a lot faster. And almost every frontline manager I've ever talked to is really strapped for time. Um, and so data is really essential for scaling your coaching efforts to uh, a medium to large team. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so we have a, a really interesting answer here that uh, I'm curious your takes on. Uh, empower reps to think creatively in order to solve their own problems and to expose reps to new approaches, allowing them to build their own style of sales. Peter, what do you make of that answer? Um, I love Dara's answer, Sam, because a lot of organizations think that sales enablement and sales coaching are about telling sellers what to say, what to know, what to do, but empowering them to be able to think on their feet when their customer interactions and buyer engagements go in this unpredicted direction or that unpredicted direction, that's going to be able to make them be able to think on their feet and develop their own style in context of what style we want them to develop. So we're empowering people to not just parrot what we give them, but to actually consult and add value and all those other things to their customers and buyers. Yeah, I particularly like the words empower in there. And then we have another answer being a diagnostician, which I like, uh, setting proactive training sessions and embracing peer coaching within the team. Another great answer. And we're actually gonna come back to this question at the end um, to sort of see what we've learned uh, with our presentation. But um, oh, here we have another one, being able to set aside your own agenda to focus on their agenda, which is unique to each individual, enabling the co-creation of new possibilities. These are fantastic answers. I love how um, engaged you all are being, and then being a sounding board and a mirror to the reps experience. Fantastic. Um, so, so keep these, these comments coming. Um, I also have just really quick a poll that I want to use to kind of just get the pulse of, uh, of our audience today. and. Um, you should see it on your screen now. And the question is, what's the biggest challenge with sales coaching in 2022? We have some answers here. Um, remote coaching, that reps don't listen, that it's too time consuming, and sort of a frank answer, which is, you know, don't know how to coach. Um, so I'm going to give folks a few seconds uh, to answer this. Um, I see some, some votes coming in already. Uh, so yeah, I'll give people a few seconds to answer. I see we got another answer to our last question, which is make them think and run their own business. So that's similarly in line with the empowering. So less of just like telling them what to do and more uh, helping them, you know, think for themselves and do the right thing themselves. Alex's comment about peer coaching, Sam, was great. You know, any of us can be a coach. Any of us can be a catalyst of change. Any of us can be a leader. It's different from managing and supervising. But on the other hand, we also want to make sure that coaching is coming from a more validated source, right? Um, in, in the before times, oftentimes I, a sales rep, would maybe ask the person who sat next to me, hey, do you have a best practice on this or a deck for that? And they may be a high performer or a low performer, but because they're geographically proximate to me is why I'm going to them for guidance. And so 
yeah, peer coaching is excellent and anyone can be, but we also want to make sure that if coaching is done, that we understand what good coaching looks like, which we'll be talking about shortly. Yep, exactly. Um, Malcolm has a good comment here about don't know how to coach related to subject matter expertise, um, getting to a place where it's difficult to fully emulate buyer personas to the degree that's needed. And I, I see we've got um, you know some answers in it, and it looks like the top one is too time consuming. And Shree, you brought this up a little bit in your first answer. Um, what what do you make of the fact that this is the the top answer here? Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, like uh, you know, most frontline managers have you know anywhere between five and fifteen reps that are reporting to them, and so the idea of week in week out being able to coach in a very nuanced. I mean, coaching is a thing that normally requires time and nuance, right? So uh, and a lot of like that that listening time. So just being able to do that for your entire team on a week in week out basis. I, mean, I totally get it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So yeah, I want to thank our audience for engaging with these polls and questions a lot. We're going to come back to this. Feel free to drop things in as we go. We can take some time and discuss them uh, during our presentation. But uh, for now, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, let's see and pass it over to Peter for his presentation. So take it away, Peter. Great, Ben, you can see my screen? Yes. Awesome, great. So um, let's begin our discussion of better sales coaching through performance metrics with a little bit of an analogy. Um, I can see the chat while we're talking, which is great. I would be totally curious as to whether anybody here on the discussion today has ever been inside a boxing ring um, as a boxer, uh, an official, uh, a coach, right? You get to go out and stand in the corner every three minutes in between rounds. I'm not guessing the answer is likely to be anybody, but it might be interesting. So why do we have this analogy? Um, the sweet science has been around for generations, really hundreds of years. Um, and the idea of, of how two fighters stand in a ring and go at one another I've never participated in it. I'm not a big fan, but the idea of the coaching that supports boxing environments is unique. For a very long period of time, coaching a boxer took place primarily before their match. During the match, it could happen just like we said, between the three minute rounds in the corner. And it was usually as scientific as throw more right, duck under their left. It was not particularly data driven. We use that as a metaphor for comparing where boxing normally has been to where boxing is today. Today, whether it's in the Olympics or in the Golden Gloves or in the professional ranks, um, boxers and boxing and coaches have a vast amount of information at their fingertips, literally, that they didn't used to have. There are sensors that are baked into the gloves uh, that deliver real-time data that help rival all of the saber metrics that we have seen come to light in baseball and all other sports. Um, this allows for coaching to be done in a very different way. And our idea here is to think about coaching less from the perspective of the gut reactions and the personal experiences of the past, and more to think about coaching as a data-driven, dashboardable type of exercise for our B2B sellers. So when we pivot from this metaphor of boxing to B2B sales, which is what we're all pretty much concerned with today. Let's take a look at why coaching should matter. Um, we have a little graph here which showcases on the x-axis time and on the y-axis money. Let's think about what the costs of coaching may or may not be through the lens of the lifetime value of a B2B sales person. So when we have, let's say, an open position, someone has left our organization, at first, when that person is not with us, we're actually kind of saving money on their territory, right? Because we're not paying salary, we're not paying commissions, but ostensibly some of their accounts are still booking and billing and generating revenue. But ultimately, when we do hire the person that's going to take over that role, it actually costs us money because we're spending money to train and develop and ready that person in most cases before they are effectively selling and in the optimal of cases before they actually are allowed to sell, whether it's a day or a month or a quarter before that happens, best training tells us not to give somebody their accounts on day one. Ultimately, when that person starts to ramp up, the calculus on their value tends to cross back over that zero line. And then the longer and longer a good or great sales professional works for our organization, 
most likely the investment is going to pay off more and more and more because the ongoing training and development is static, but their contribution continues to grow over time. So how do we do this as sales enablers? How do we support this? Well, we think about it through four different lenses. Sales enablement leaders can, first of all, make sure that they can control and hopefully shrink the time to competency for all new sellers who are learning the new skills, knowledge, and process that we need to teach them, or for reboarding a competency that's new to a tenured seller who's with our organization. We also can control the quality of execution, how well they do their jobs, obviously through the various enablement initiatives and the KPIs that we use to support great B2B sales management. We also want to make it easy for them to do their jobs, whether it's through technology, through data, through process, through coaching. We want to ease the execution for folks to get their jobs done and get to their numbers. And then finally, we want to make sure that we're optimizing their length of contribution to make sure that that line keeps going up while the cost goes up at a slower pace. So the general idea behind this is to validate why it's important to invest in our sales talent. And actually, when we look at the high performing organizations and high growth organizations within Forrester's research, we discover a few data points that help validate why coaching and some of the elements that we'll talk about today are so important. So for starters, we know that high growth companies are 63% more likely than low growth companies to make sure that for every single new offering we provide to the marketplace, we're actually providing development and readiness programs to support it. Secondly, these high growth organizations defined as 30% or more year to year growth, they're 30, 43% more likely to make sure that they provide coaches, managers with the tools that they need so that they can observe. Remember, you know, using the ears and using the eyes more than just the mouth so that they can turn that give a man a fish moment into a teach a man a fish moment. And they're 40% more likely to measure sales manager coaching effectiveness based on the leading indicators, not the lagging indicators that have already happened. Did you make your number? Did the deal size go up? Did the deal cycle go down? But the leading indicators, such as the engagement and the certification of new competencies, the development, the delivery, and the feedback on the training and development pieces that we provide. So these are three different data points that we have here at Forrester, just to kind of validate why this topic is so important to all of us here today. And if I could chime in for a minute, um, you know, leading indicators are, are at the heart of what SetSail does. Our system helps sales orgs manage their reps based on the strongest leading indicators of revenue. Um, so it's great to see that high-performing orgs are 40% more likely to measure manager coaching effectiveness on leading indicators. Peter, in your experience, what prevents this number from being even higher? Like what barriers do organizations face uh, in using leading indicators for this purpose? Because coaching is too often, I think, Sri, conflated with pipeline management. You know, a coaching conversation is not let's take a look at your pipeline and see where it is. A coaching conversation is about behavior, process, knowledge, skills, and competencies. It's okay to say when I was in your role, this is what I did to succeed. But we want to make sure that the coaching is separated out from that. And I'd say the other answer, Sri, is just that organizations are still kind of hesitant to devote enough resources to the idea of coaching. Um, so we're deep in the football playoffs right now. The Patriots are out. They probably didn't deserve to go much further. I have to say Tom can go do what he's going to do. And we kind of love him and we kind of hate him here in the Massachusetts area. Um, but, um, you know, the typical NFL team has 53, 58, I think players, and they all have one head coach, but they now average about 22 other coaches discipline coaches. You've got your linebackers coach. You've got your special teams coaches. You've got coaches for all these different disciplines. And they make that investment because there is institutional knowledge, there is practitioner knowledge, and there's the ability to be a source of management and expertise that's not my direct manager. And so coaching, like we started to say earlier, can be done in a lot of fronts. We are seeing more companies who are successful invest in this idea, for instance, of a field sales coach. It's a great interim role between individual contributor and solid manager. And it's an opportunity for folks to have kind of one foot still in the field and one foot in the managerial ranks to be a trusted source for the folks in the field, but also help drive some of the messaging and needs from the organization down to the team. So I think hesitancy to prioritize coaching and misinterpreting coaching probably three are the things that we see happening most often there. 
All right, so moving on. Um, we have a little bit of a mathematical exercise here for you guys. We'll spin through this relatively quickly, and then we'll get to the four main stages of uh, modern B2B coaching excellence, and then talk about the dashboard that we're going to share with you idea, uh, the idea we're going to share with you today. So the idea of can we afford to invest in sales coaching might be can we afford not to invest in sales coaching. So work with me here, and let's go through some of our math. Let's think about a typical sales sub-organization, perhaps um, a BDR or inside sales organization that's responsible for generating seven point something million dollars in revenue. And the reason you have the 12 months of the year here is we want to look at the natural ebb and flow of sales talent migration. So this content was prepared before folks started talking about the great resignation. And so all the math that you're going to see here to justify sales coaching is extraordinarily conservative. Let's take a look at what we're talking about. First of all, um, let's assume for the sake of our argument that there's 15% turnover amongst this sub portion of our sales force. That's completely wrong, right? We know that in reality, especially for a role like a BDR, it's probably at least twice that right now, but we want to be super conservative with our math. As we go through our math, let's think about this BDR floor and we expect everybody to do 360 per year, 7.2 million for the group. Okay. So what happens when we do inevitably lose some folks? Okay, so someone is going to leave us in February and the rest of their 360K is going to go away because they're not going to be delivering it. Then someone leaves us in March, someone leaves us in July, and yet we know that turnover happens. And so we try to hire people. There's, you know, usually a few months in between losing someone and putting someone back in. And so the backfill for these folks happens February to June, March to July, et cetera. And those folks magically get up to speed immediately, which we know is also not true. And they start booking deals and blah, blah, blah. But just the loss at a very, very modest 15%, not very realistic in 2022 turnover rate means that we're already losing about 4% of the value of our this expected book of business just because of the natural evolution and migration of sales talent. Obviously, where we're going here is to explain that the idea of coaching can support and mitigate some of these losses. But wait, there's more. It's not just about the 330K that we lose in productivity from those folks. There's also all of these expenses that accrue towards having to hire, develop, train, onboard, and certify new sellers. These are all fairly industry standards here. And when we add that into the 330, now we're up to about 6 7% of the total of that $7.2 million book of business. So the idea from this math exercise is essentially the following. We have to assume that given the markets that we play in, there's going to be sales turnover. What can we do to mitigate sales turnover? Can we just throw more money at people? Well, for a lot of sales roles, we can't just award them with more money. And we know from all of our research that more and more of our B2B sales professionals, especially millennials and Gen Zers, are focused on far more than just money, even when they take commissioned, variably compensated sales positions. They're looking for company culture. They're looking for diversity, equity, and inclusion. They're looking for sustainability. They're looking for a corporate culture in addition to how much you're going to pay me to sell this number of products. Part of that corporate culture is making me as a professional better at my craft not just teaching me the things that I need to know to sell your products right now, but teaching me professional skills, which translates into the coaching to make me a better seller, as we talked about during our opening Q&A, Sam, not just a parator of sales terms, but a solver of customer problems. And through coaching, we have the opportunity to minimize, mitigate at least the impacts of the inevitable great resignation. So when we look at how we translate this into coaching, we believe that there are four main components of great sales coaching. Culture, which I started to describe, insights, what we can learn and data that we provide to ourselves, the actions that happen with and around these coaching conversations and interactions, and having the appropriate processes and tools in place. So let's double click into each of those one by one and talk about some of the best practices that we believe are appropriate. Starting with culture, um, I'm pausing for a second because just this morning I had another one of my weekly meetings with a colleague, Nancy Maluso, when we're actually presenting this coming spring at our, our big customer event about sales motivation. And we're talking about culture, compensation, and coaching as the three prime 
drivers of motivation for B2B salespeople. And I pause for a moment because we're talking so much about culture. It's been so much in the news. Obviously, the pandemic has driven most organizations to recognize not just how their culture has to change, but also how it needs to continuously evolve to catch up to the mores of the predominant age cohorts that are coming into their, their companies. I had a customer meeting this morning, a guided session with an organization whose average salesperson is kind of this right here, right? Middle-aged guy, you know, and, and these, you know, we don't take change very well. And so they're talking about how their motions have changed and their buyers have changed and their products have changed. It's not a culture that's really one that embraces change. And these are big challenges that we have to face. In a coaching environment, we have to remember that the culture of coaching isn't just going to be about that one mouth. It's going to be about those two ears and those two eyes. It's going to be listening and self-discovery for all parties involved. Sure, it's important for someone who is an old hand at selling our products to glean their knowledge onto the newer hands, right? But it's also about listening. It's about empathizing. Some of it's a little bit about therapeutic types of interactions. And a culture that supports coaching that's different from just, I need you to make more phone calls. I need you to make a bigger pipeline. That's not coaching. That's just supervising. Another cultural component is that we want to make sure that it is present and part of every stage of the sales cycle or every component of the buyer's journey. We call those buyer's journey stages discover, evaluate, commit, and then engage. Then there are post-sale components. And throughout each of those cycle slash journey phases, it's super important to make sure that coaching is part of it. Too often we see organizations with sales leaders who dive in only when there's a problem. Well, guess what? Then you are associated with problematic environments and you're going to feel a little bit itchy and squitchy about exposing your feelings to your boss, your direct manager, about how your deals are going. But if they're involved early and often, it becomes a regular cadence. It becomes essentially a safe space. And we also want to make sure that coaching is tied to career development. Another meeting that I had earlier today, we've had a lot already today, was with a customer who was struggling with their sales onboarding. And we kind of came to the place where we talked about how sales onboarding is actually really only the second of three steps in the entire sales talent life cycle. We talked about establishing core competencies for every sales role that are divided up amongst which competencies do we buy when we hire someone, <clears throat> which competencies do we then provide and build through onboarding, and then which competencies define so great at each sales role that that person is promotable. And we talked about it through a couple of lenses, but we want to make sure that coaching is not just about the deals and hitting the numbers, but about your potential progression within our organization. Now, again, we all know that great salespeople don't necessarily make or even want to become great sales managers. Another Boston sports metaphor here, Sam, best hitter of all time, Ted Williams, right? Obviously. <clears throat> but yet when Bleacher Report published its list of the 10 worst baseball managers of all time, Ted was on the list. He was horrible. He had no people skills. He was kind of a jerk, let's be honest with it, right? He never even tipped his hat in that final at-bat in Fenway Park. But he was a great individual contributor. He just didn't have the competencies. So that's okay. Career development doesn't mean becoming a manager. It means you can become a subject matter expert. You can become a mentor. You can become a coach, the peer coaching that we talked about earlier. So the second element of great coaching is about insights. This is about what we learn to make sure that our coaching is based on facts. I saw just a hilarious, kind of depressing meme the other day about you know our life and our country and our world right now. Let's not get political, but it said, we used to base our opinions on facts. Now we do it the other way around. Um, we want to make sure that we're using real insights and real data gained from an integrated technology platform where the CRM, the source of record for all of our opportunities, is intimately integrated with all of the other tools, the content, the readiness, the analytics, the engagement that our salespeople are using to advance their deals. So how do these insights come to us? We need to be able to observe. So again, um, we think about boxing. The observation in the past used to be just about seeing what was going on, now we have the data available. Sales rep compensation was originally designed, HBR published on this recently, because 
it was only designable based on the outcomes of sales rep activity because the only way we could see what a sales rep was doing their job well or not was if they made enough sales or not. But today we have all sorts of signals that we can understand about what sales reps are saying, sending, doing, how they're performing. The day is not far away when there's going to be these biometric tools where I can look into my camera and it can tell me whether my I'm speaking too fast or my voice is rising too high, right? All these things are, are pretty close. We know that from conversation intelligence tools, the utilization of certain words and terms is out there, but the biometrics are going to follow pretty shortly as well. Um, so dashboard insights. We're going to flip to this for the last part of my presentation today. And I see sort of out of the corner of my eye, a lot of comments coming in. Keep on with the questions and the comments, folks, because Sam and we will all address those later on. We need to make, make sure that we're creating appropriate dashboards to monitor how we're coaching, are we doing effectively, but also whether or not the coaching is working and whether we as enablement professionals are inspiring the right types of coaching. And then finally is the idea about the connections between actions and performance. Sure, if I make more calls and make more outreaches and share more content on LinkedIn, it's probable that I'll eventually have a bigger pipeline and more deals. But do we really know that? The number one most popular topic that customers ask my colleagues and me to talk about these days is how do we measure the impact of our sales enablement initiatives? Coaching, converting sales kickoff from live to virtual, a new methodology, fixing our onboarding, buying some software, whatever it might be. We want to make sure that we're always looking at performance outcomes and the behaviors that went into that. And Sri, I know you guys have a lot to talk about when it comes to this idea of looking at these connections between the stuff that we do and the outcomes that result from that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we see companies primarily track um, a few things. One is activities such as meetings. Um, and then on the other hand, you have outcomes such as quota. And the thing is that once you get beyond very short sales cycles, there's, a, there's quite a large space between holding a meeting and closing a deal. And you know, our perspective is that there's a range of metrics in between activities and outcomes, things like uh, reaching power, champion building, conducting good discovery, and so on. And, and it's really important to track these as well. And uh, you know, I'll definitely talk about that later, later on in the hour. Yeah, super. Thanks. You know, we, we often talk about the measurement of sales enablement as, as somewhere between two extremes. At one extreme, you have an apple falls from a tree. There's only one reason why. It's Newtonian physics, right? It's gravity. And on the other extreme, you have the butterfly effect. You guys, right, you know, you see this in movies, right? A butterfly flaps its wings in the Amazon. And three days later, there's a tornado in Texas because the butterfly flapped its wings. I mean, that's really, really hard to prove. So we encourage folks to think about what facts and data can you collect that will legitimately be tied into the impact that you have. Somewhere between the apple and the butterfly is probably the sweet spot for most organizations. So number three is process and tools. Everybody's favorite topic, right? But there are actually some really important coaching elements here that we want to talk about. First of all is a regular cadence that an individual contributor and their direct manager have. Yes, we have pipeline reviews. Yes, we have regularly scheduled meetings. Yes, we can decide whether we're going to have that emasculating, everybody talk to me about your pipeline right now in front of everybody else meeting. Or do we have time consuming? We talked about that up front, right? That was the number one result of the poll, but important one-to-ones with sellers. The idea is that if we have a regularly scheduled coaching conversation, of course, we're going to talk about our deals, but the focus is on that manager being a force multiplier, turning me into such a great seller through coaching that I can someday become a manager. And as our company grows and grows and scales, we're multiplying the effectiveness of our own sales best practices within the organization. This can be once a month. It can be stand up in the hallway when that happens again for two minutes per day. It doesn't matter. But having a regularly scheduled touch base, which is dedicated to coaching, again, it's a lot of different pieces, right? It's part therapy. It's part safe place. It's part deal management. But there's a lot of opportunities to turn that into a positive. Next, we have the idea of just in time. So this is the opposite of traditional boxing, and it's the mainstay of what we talked about in our analogy. Um, Sam, I don't know. I, I didn't see in my eye with my eye anybody who actually had ever been inside a boxing ring. So I don't know whether this metaphor played out for anybody in their own experience or not. Um, 
So, someone did karate. I, I that's close enough. Yeah, to my I mind. think I went to about four karate classes when I was a kid. That was about it. Um, <laughs> this is my self defense, right? When you're an analyst. So um, the idea of just in time coaching in a field environment. Uh, again, let's make sure we're not promoting the idea of me going in and closing Sam's deals for Sam. Let's not assume that every sales call needs to be four legs or six legs. But the idea of just in time coaching. There's a lot of different ways around it. There are some customer service operations these days, not B2B this world, but there are some where there are some like CSRs, you'll be on the phone and they'll actually have things coming through their ear while they're talking. Not really much of a fan of that, right? The whole you know, Rasputin thing doesn't really play out very well with, with B2B selling. But when we talk about just-in-time coaching, what we are saying is it doesn't have to be days after an event happened. Just-in-time coaching can happen when certain suggestions can come to me on my screen, which can be driven by AI pre-planned cadences, especially if it's a fairly low complexity, high volume type of repeatable, repeatable or repetitive type of sales uh, play that folks have in there. And other ways to look for the opportunity to do coaching that's not customer facing. Video-based role-playing is hot hot, hot, becoming a big deal. Right now, folks want to consume more than they want to give. You know, and we're salespeople. We typically are going to take a penny rather than give a penny, but that's okay. I think eventually that market will probably come around. And we want to make sure that the guidance and advice is accessible asynchronously. Our coaching doesn't necessarily have to just be when we have our weekly call, whether it's a recording of a session, looking at a technology-based solution to search some in-house best practices video by keyword and bring me to that moment in the practice presentation that allowed a peer of mine who was judged by our mutual boss to deliver the best pitch. Lots of different opportunities to do that. So finally, let's talk about actions. This is an important part of coaching. Peter, if I can stop you for, for half a second, there are a couple questions that I, I think are super relevant to what you're talking let's about right it. now. Someone just asked, yeah, they, they do a fortnightly cadence for coaching sessions outside of the pipeline review. Uh, he asks, is that a right, a, a correct cadence? Fortnightly, I believe, every other week. There we Absolutely. Go. Yeah. And, and um, kudos okay. to us for knowing what fortnight means, by the way, right? It's not a game. It's, it's every other week. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and then also, Shri, I, I mean, you touched on this a little bit, but... Um, are there any metrics you'd recommend as being particularly important when it comes to those insights we use when we coach? Are there some They're coming up. Examples? So there are, uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, Sri, go ahead. Yeah, that was for you. Um, yeah, so there are definitely some metrics that come from the role, but one of the interesting things, like working with customers, setting up some of these dashboards for them, is that um, each sales process is different, and you want to track a different set of metrics, right? Like, of course... Every AE wants to reach power, no doubt, but who is power, right? That varies depending on whether you're selling an IT software, whether you're selling a, a product management software, that person is actually a different person. So the, the specifics of how you construct that metric are, are a little bit different. And there's just a lot of nuance um, that comes from the product, the um, market segment, um, you know, what, uh, what sales methodology you're using. Um, so uh, I wish I could give a one size fits all answer, but it, it varies a lot. Yeah, good point. And yeah, we're about two slides away from that whole uh, demonstration, so we're all good. Um, let's just wrap up our mainstays by talking very briefly about actions. We want to make sure that coaching um, environments are not just, you know, leaving something on the table. We want to make sure that there are short, medium, and long-term goals. Goals can be, I'm going to learn about, I'm going to practice. Goals can also be, I, the coach, the manager, am going to do the following to support what I've asked you to do. That's super, super important. We both have a stake in your success. Me telling you to go do something isn't really going to help you as much as me also taking some action items to support your improvement. And we want to make sure that the coaching that we're doing is not in conflict with or at odds with the traditional sales readiness, learning and development activities that the company is providing, which means that best practices in not just coaching itself, but what we're coaching to should be codified for the organization by the sales enablement team. All right, Sam, let's get to that dashboard idea. This is how we suggest building a dashboard. So we measure lots and lots of things, right? 
And these are all just little gray balls on the screen right now. But our suggestion is to think about all the possible things that one can measure. And we'll show you our suggested examples in just another moment, um, Ganesh. And think about grouping these into certain categories. Um, by categories, we mean things that relate sort of to one another, right, Sri? Yeah, that's right. And then the idea is to think about what should those categories be. Our suggestion is to think about first the outcome of what our hopeful coaching support has developed, the lagging indicators that are basically mirror metrics. There are things that we look back and they, they happened in the past. But then we also want to look at the leading indicators, the activities, the things that folks are doing on the path towards hopefully making their number. And we want to look at the learning indicators. These are from the standpoint of organizations that believe their salespeople need to be good at their jobs, but good is going to be defined different a year from now than it is today. We have to learn how to sell to a new buyer that our company decided to sell to. We need to sell a different type of product. We merged or acquired with another company and we have a different suite of solutions to sell. All sorts of things that are gonna change over time. So our suggestion is to take a look at these three types of measurable KPIs and then build them into a dashboard. So our dashboard example kind of looks something like this. First of all, you want to think about the different categories that we discussed momentarily ago, and then how you want to weight them. So for example, let's say we have three different types of KPIs. We have activity, we have learning and certification, and we have the lagging indicator outcomes. So this is just an example, it's just a demo, and you guys will get a PDF that'll include this stuff after the event today. But let's say we look at KPIs such as number of meetings, calls, leads that are generated by sales, response time. Let's say we decide, just for giggles today, right? Just a suggestion that it's 30% of what we think is the appropriate way to evaluate the effectiveness of our coaching of our sellers. Let's say we just take each of those four and we divide them into one quarter of the 30%. So if we're going to think about the um, uh, activities as 30%, maybe we think about the outcomes as 50% of our coaching effectiveness with the KPIs such as product mix, quota attainment, win rate, et cetera. And then we look at the learning indicators as perhaps 20%. You can play around with all of these numbers to your heart's content. This is just sort of a suggestion, but the idea is that when we collect this information on what they do, what they sell, and how they learn, we're able to come up with an overall score based on literally just how the formulas in the spreadsheet play themselves out. Now we've thrown a bunch of static sample information into this dashboard, but the general idea, if I can mouse over the things here, is to think about how important are what reps do how important is what are what reps accomplish and how important are how they learn from our perspective as sales leaders, sales enablement leaders, learning and development specialists, and folks who are focused and obsessed with sales readiness. So that's the idea of a dashboard. Finally, we referenced this earlier. We want to make sure that when we're putting something like this together, that we don't use the same formula for all roles, all regions, all business units, because guess what? There's a lot of different variables amongst the people who sell for us and therefore how we coach them and therefore how we have to create a dashboard for evaluating whether or not we're coaching them well. So there's three different examples that we wanna share with you. First, you wanna think about tenure. We know from our own research at Forrester, for example, that folks who have been on board for less than a year have very different learning preferences than folks who have been selling for the organization for three years or five years or 10 years. So you wanna look at your different amounts of tenure with the organization or tenure in your sales career. Folks who are this have been doing it a long time and we don't necessarily wanna learn the same way in which people the age of my kids prefer to learn and prefer to be coached. Another opportunity is role. You might have SDRs, BDRs, account executives, global overlays, sales engineers, solution specialists. Coaching is gonna be different based on the persona and therefore the dashboard and the weights themselves that we talked about with our little math is probably likely to change. And by the way, you may think that you've got a good formula, but you're never gonna know until you test it out in the marketplace. 
to use the Ted Williams example, right? You're in the Hall of Fame if you only fail two thirds of the time you go up to bat. Some of these dashboards won't always work out. And then finally, you wanna think about your organization. There may be geographical differences or there may be hierarchical differences. Reps, first line managers, second line managers, et cetera. I mean, it's true, right? Everybody's gonna be judged and coached and dashboarded in different ways. Totally, I mean, this, this really echoes our experience. Like when you're comparing metrics between two reps who aren't in comparable situations, um, in practice, when you look at the dashboard, it's really obvious, like the metrics look very, very different. Um, so for example, if you're measuring activity related to contracting discussions, obviously a ramping rep is going to look uh, uh, a little different than a ramped rep. Um, and similarly, enterprise reps, just by virtue of having larger deals um, with longer cycles will do uh, will perform differently on all of the metrics that you're looking at. So you really have to compare apples to apples if you wanna derive kind of a coaching insight that's useful. That's great. Hey, you know, I'm watching the clock. Um, Sam and Sri, if you guys want to take it from here, um, I think I want to make sure that you have the opportunity to share some of the content that you were planning on going. And the rest of our presentation, it's just basically one slide, but I want to hand the floor back over to you guys now. Okay, great. Um, before we go, I, I think there's just like a, one really quick question that uh, harkens back to something you said earlier. Uh, from Matthew, he asks, what are some examples of what the coach would commit? You talked about the rep and the coach each having um, skin in the game, sort of, and each committing something to the other. I'm going to find a great article to read. I'm going to find an example of one of your peers doing a great job of this. I'm going to go outside our company and do some research for you on best practices from other industries and see if they translate. I'm going to take some time and dig into your deals and see if I can detect some patterns. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. Sometimes it's just the act of making that commitment as well as the specific action itself that sends a very positive message to the coachee. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a great answer. And then, yeah, so I will pass it back to Sri now uh, to sort of talk more about the Sutile approach. And I think you'll find there are a lot of similarities here. Um, but uh, we have some some insights of our own that we want to share. So Shri, do you want to take it away? Yeah, sounds good. Um, and let me just start with the problem we're solving, which is that there is a critical gap between the data that you have today and, and your ability as a coach to derive useful guidance for your reps. Um, so when we start working with customers, again, we find they use a few main kinds of metrics. Um, on the one side, they're looking at activity volumes, such as meetings, uh, emails, and so on. Um, and while these are useful, there's a couple of challenges. First off, um, if you're getting them from the CRM, now you're reliant on the rep having to log these activities, which they have minimal motivation to do. Um, when we work with customers, we typically find around 50 to 60% of activities and contacts are, are missing from the CRM. So it can be hard to even trust activity data if you're, if you're getting it from the CRM. Um, and then the second and more fundamental problem um, with activity volumes is that they're just uh, not the best predictors of revenue. We, we all know this, but just to give an example, if a deal has meetings on it, that's not particularly meaningful if those meetings aren't with power, if the rep hasn't built a champion, if security hasn't been cleared as a hurdle, um, and, and so on. So, you know, of course, activity volumes matter, but they only tell a portion of the story of, of rep effectiveness. And then flipping to the opposite kind of metric, you have revenue outcomes, most notably quota, but for a BDR or SDR, it can be something like uh, pipeline created, for example. Um, and of course, these are the metrics that we care about in themselves, but from the standpoint of coaching, we want something more actionable, right? If a, if a rep has low quota performance, the question for the coach is what specific behaviors does the rep need to do better? Um, and the quota data on its own doesn't tell you that. There is a third kind of metric um, that we often see, which is um, progress measures like uh, stage progression. Um, and these are starting to get kind of closer to the right level for coaching somewhere in between uh, a raw activity volume and a final revenue outcome. But again, um, they have this critical problem, which is that the rep needs to log them. Um, and in practice, they don't do that because of a lack of incentive to, to keep things up to date, but also things like sandbagging if you're talking about stage. Um, so you know, in our experience, the solution is not to set up a bunch of fields in your CRM um, that your reps have to fill out, because in practice, reps don't do it. So you don't get great data, but also, you don't want your reps focusing on logging. You want them focusing on 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 selling, right? So that that's not that's where they should be spending their time. And so um, on this slide, um, we kind of get into our solution. Um, really, the goal of what we're trying to do with our entire solution is come up with 
good metrics for coaching, which are um, one, they have to be close to action, but still a good predictor of revenue. So this is sort of the, the clear connection that, uh, that, that Peter mentioned. Um, and then secondly, um, they shouldn't be logged by the rep. And this system that you see here is sort of designed to do those two things. Um, so let me just walk through it. There's three parts to our system. First, we gather sales data from every source. Um, this includes CRM, but also email, calendar, and Zoom. Um, again, if you want to be if you want to not be reliant on rep logging, then you need to get data directly from the places the rep is actually interacting with clients. Second, um, we find uh, your top signals. So let me first introduce kind of the concept of a signal. Um, this is something we talk about a lot at Set Sale. A signal is just processed activity data. So our infrastructure can ingest a meeting on the one side. And on the other, tell you about that meeting. Like, was it with a VP? Was it the first time that contact engaged with the rep? Um, was a trial discussed, et cetera? So a little bit like that uh, Fitbit idea that Peter mentioned as well. Our technology can automatically detect hundreds of signals from activity data. Um, but at the same time, uh, tracking hundreds of signals at once is way too much for any sales user. So um, typically, our customers want to track somewhere between 5 and 20 signals um, that kind of derive from their sales process. Sometimes they know what those signals are just because they have a very well-specified sales process. Other times they want our guidance, in which case we can run what we call a discover analysis. Um, basically what this is, is we overlay all of these hundreds of signals onto your historical sales data. And through a data analysis, we tell you what are the top signals that tend to separate mo the most effective reps from everyone else, right? So what are the patterns what are the things that distinguish your top performers? We can do that through data analysis and through kind of the, the technology, uh, the signal technology that we have here. So either way, at the end of step two, you're getting your top signals, whether those are coming from, um, from you knowing what those are or from us kind of running this kind of analysis. Once this is done, we move on to the third step in our product, which is to overlay these top signals onto your current reps and deals. So now you can understand how each rep and deal is performing against the key signals in your sales process. And again, um, two things. One is that's without the rep having to log anything, that's critical. Second is uh, we're really focused on the top signals and, and the goal, what we're trying to do is that um, we want a manager to look at a screen in 10 seconds and understand like, is this rep, do, what are the top behaviors that this rep is and isn't doing, right? We wanna minimize the manager having to dig a lot. Um, to my point earlier in the, in the, in the talk, like, the whole goal is to, to help managers scale. Like that's one of the primary use cases of, of all of this data, in addition to kind of guiding you to the right insight. So, so um, kind of on the next slide, um, if you could flip to that, Sam, we're showing um, uh, our dashboard uh, for a single rep. Um, and uh, I know it's a little small on screen here, but um, we're showing how each rep is doing against each key signal in your sales process. And again, this will vary from customer to customer. The right signals will differ based on whether you're an enterprise rep selling IT, you're a mid-market rep selling a different kind of product. Um, so these, these can vary and it, it's quite customizable. Um, the other thing that we allow you to do is set clear goals, right? So now to Peter's point about uh, commitments, we can, our system will allow you to set to, once you've identified these top signals to set a goal and say, this is how much of this behavior we want to see in a given time period, in, in a week or a month or, or whatever makes sense uh, for your business. So again, the goal is in 20 seconds, you can look at the screen, you can have this up during a coaching conversation and a manager can understand what are the behaviors that the rep is performing well, what are the ones they need to improve in, um, and they can get this kind of insight you know, um, without necessarily having to watch a lot of calls um, and spend a lot of time in diagnosis, right? You can get to them right away. Um, so I know we're running up on time. Just last slide here from me. Um, wanted to provide a quick case study um, this is from Product Board, which is a great success story for us. We work with their SDR team, um, and they did want to increase activity volume on the one hand, but they also wanted to um, uh, get more focus on specific kinds of activities. So one example of this is that they wanted reps to personalize their outreach with things like Loom videos. Um, and with SetSail, they were able to track that in an automated way, um, and um, they were able to ultimately drive real behavioral change. You can see it both in the data on the right of the slide, you can see um, these metrics going up before um, versus uh, from before to um, with set sale. You can also see it um, in this quote from Kylie, who's an SDR manager at Product Board. She says that set sale was clearly driving behavioral change. We were seeing an impact and we had our best month ever. Um, so that's my content. Um, you know, My final plug is that as you think about and plan your coaching programs, 
think critically about the data side. You know, how do you empower your coaches with the right data so they can coach the right behaviors to the right reps in as efficient and scalable a way as possible? So with that, I'll kick it back over to you, Sam. Okay, great. Thank you, Shri. Um, again, a lot of really interesting points there, a lot to digest. And this leads us back to the question we asked at the top. What does it mean to be a good sales coach? I think we have a lot more clarity here. Um, and so to the audience, I'd again ask you to put your answer in the chat, maybe with something that you've learned today. Uh, and I'll also ask uh, Peter to sum up his answer, maybe given everything he's talked about. Peter, what would you say your key takeaway is from all of this? Good sales coaching remains um, using all of our senses and our powers to make sure that we are empowering and not just supervising, empowering excellence and not just supervising activity. Um, the culture, the insights, the process, you know, these are all important components of making sure that that happens on a very day-to-day -day basis amongst people who are officially coaches, almost more importantly, amongst people who are given and designated coaching responsibility. With great coaching comes great responsibility, right? Yep, good reference. <laughs> um, and then, Shri, I'd, I'd ask you the, the same question. Given the context of everything you've presented on, what would you say your key takeaway is to answering this question? Yeah, I mean, just like watching Peter's presentation, it just sort of highlighted to me how important it is to think about coaching programmatically. Like, as a sales leader, you have to think about coaching kind of a, from a programmatic lens. How do I set up the right coaching program? Um, and, uh, you know, what are all the different pieces of that, of which data is a critical component, but there are others as well. So um, so that was sort of my takeaway. Okay, great. So we've been getting some questions in our remaining time. I want to try to get to these. Um, one recent one from uh, Candice, she's asking about uh, coaching guidance is very helpful to my reps, but she's worried about her sales managers. So I, I think this comes down, Peter, to uh, is there such a thing as coaching for coaches and what does that look like? Hey, definitely. You know, it's all about competencies. What skills, knowledge and process expertise do we expect everybody in our sales organization to have? Um, coaching capabilities are a must have, not a nice to have competency for your sales managers. And so Maybe you could be a great salesperson and maybe you can qualify for winner's circle, <clears throat> but you might not be eligible for promotion to manager if you haven't learned or been formally certified on externally or internally how to be a good coach. So really, as we cascade up from first line manager to second line manager up to the chief sales officer, what does good look like in that job needs to be codified by the organization and how do we get there? is a responsibility from our perspective of sales enablement to make sure everybody has access to those opportunities. And if I could jump in on that as well, I think data can actually be helpful here as well, right? So um, when, as you're doing this cascading up, um, you know, from our standpoint, we have screens that essentially aggregate um, data to um, manager level, to second line manager levels, to frontline manager levels. So um, it's even useful there to get kind of a leading indicator of, uh, of, uh, of, of a team. So tracking coaches on similar metrics, the metrics of their, their team, basically, and aggregating that. Exactly. Okay, great. So there's another question here. How do you keep training schedules when you can't take time uh, people off the phone due to small staff, which kind of gets back to that time-consuming question. Um, Shri, I'm curious your take on this, on the idea of maybe something like providing these insights directly to reps rather than having to go through the coach. Yeah, this is one of our big investment areas is... Um, is giving reps the ability to see their own data. So we we you know uh, we've been focused primarily on surfacing these insights to managers, but um, you know giving these insights to reps allows them to kind of um, uh, kind of benchmark themselves against others and at least have a starting point to think about um, ways that they can self improve. Okay, great. Yeah, I like that a lot. So we are coming up on time. I think actually a, a great way to end, Alex has a, a really good answer, I think, from his learnings from this. He says, uh, always tying coaching to the rep's career development will drive trust and buy-in, as well as general motivation and excitement for true growth. And with this should come natural improvements in day-to-day. -day. So so wise words from Alex. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, yeah, I just want to say this has been great. Thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us today. 
It's been a lively discussion. Uh, we always appreciate when you take time out of your busy schedule. I hope you've learned a lot. I'll remind everyone, uh, we'll send out the recording and the deck shortly after this. And lastly, uh, I just wanna say thank you to our wonderful speakers. Thank you for coming on, Peter. And uh, thank you for joining us straight. Thanks so much for having me. And one last time, thank you to everyone in the audience. Um, we truly appreciate it and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone.